Dr. Eric Zenzius, our Saturday keynote speaker. Um, I first met Eric kind of virtually through the op-ed pages of the New York Times. Um, he wrote a piece called Mr. Saudi's Ecological Economy. And I'm sure some of you have seen this. It certainly has went around the biophysical economic circles in recent years. When I read this, this was one of those Damn, I wish I wrote this article, you know? It was just so good. And I immediately emailed it around, called friends, family, called my mom. I was like, you've got to read this piece. This is what I've been trying to say for years. <laughs> and there it was in the New York Times. It was just such a great, great, uh, great, great, well-written piece. Um, and then I realized that this guy, Eric Zensi, was right down the road in Montpelier, and I didn't even know it. And so I immediately started figuring out how to get him to UVM. Now he's here. <laughs> it took a little while, but we got you here. Um, Eric is first and foremost a writer, but that's probably too narrow of a term to really describe his work. He's a novelist. He's authored the best-selling um, novel Panama, which is a historical thriller mystery novel, which I'm halfway through right now. Thanks for my copy. Um, he's an essayist. He's got pieces and publications ranging from the New York Times to the Chronicle of Higher Education. Uh, North American Review, to Orion, Adbusters, The Daily News, which he writes in a lot. Some of you might know The Daily News is the newsletter of the Center for the Advancement of the Steady State Economy. He's also an historian. He has two new books out this fall. One he might say a few words about. This is hot off the presses as of just a few days ago. The Other Road to Serfdom and the Path to a Sustainable Democracy. Um, he also has another book coming out this fall called Greening Vermont, which is really a long overdue history of the progressive environmental movement and progressive environmental policy in our little small state here of Vermont. It's going to immediately be a classic, I'm sure. Um, Eric is also a teacher. He's influenced students for decades from Goddard College in Vermont to international programs in Prague. He now teaches at UVM every fall and he spends each spring out at Washington University in St. Louis. And I'll just note, as a teacher, um, he's found very creative ways to empower students to make a difference, actually while being a student, right? I mean, we, we kind of have this philosophy here at the Gun Institute, like, why, why wait? <laughs> Let's do it now. And a couple semesters ago, he updated the Genuine Progress Indicator for Vermont, which some of you might know is this alternative way of measuring economic well-being uh, for, for an economy. Um, and his students then went out and met with members of the Vermont legislation. And last spring, with Eric pushing and his students pushing and these legislators pushing and the NGOs pushing, Vermont became the first state in the country to pass a law that requires the use and the, the generation of a genuine progress indicator and the use of it in our policy, which includes all the topics we've been talking about today. Um, so. real testament to, to who he is as a man and, and how he takes a scholarship and really puts it on the street. So I could go on and on, but I, I know you want to hear from the why didn't I think of that guy, Eric Zenzi. Jeez, I, I, I could listen to that longer. <laughs> Thanks, John. Um, yeah, so among the hats I wear as an historian, and when we were talking about the uh, Biophysical Economics Conference coming here, I, uh, we were sitting around the table at the Gund and people were like, panels, what are we going to do? Who's going to give talks? And um, this subject, I mentioned that I was preparing this chapter for uh, State of the World. I'm pointing to you, Tom. Um, and uh, a decision was made that didn't really involve me, that that would be a fine thing to do. So if this is not to your taste, take it up with John and Brian and <laughs> some other people here. Um, this is a kind of historical review of uh, some of our thinking about energy, specifically the tracing the path from back then to energy as a master resource, the kind of understanding that biophysical economics and ecological economics embodies today. Um, as an historian, I think history is good for you. Um, you, you may be able to draw some of your own lessons. We start with a bit of a prologue. Uh, how many of you have ever heard of this guy? Carno cycle. Yeah, sure, sure. Okay, Carno cycle. 
how many of you knew that his father was exiled with Napoleon? Okay, now we're getting somewhere. Now I got stuff. <laughs> now I got stuff I can tell you. Uh, uh, he's generally credited with uh, being the guy who's in whose work the first intimation of the second law of thermodynamics is visible. Um, it's not fully visible, but there it is. And the work that it's semi-visible in is called uh, Reflections on the Motive Power of Fire, a book that he wrote. Um, I, if you saw the years, you might have done the math. He died pretty young. Uh, published in 1824, nine years after uh, Napoleon's defeat at Waterloo, which is not just a random fact. Um, this book was written not as an abstract treatise in physics. It was written as a handbook on how to buy a steam engine. He wanted to guide his countrymen to being wise in their purchase of this new technology, because there was a lot of crappy stuff on the market, stuff that um, wasn't very efficient. And what he noticed and told uh, prospective steam engine buyers was that uh, it wasn't just about the size of the firebox or the amount of heat you could get. It was about the difference in heat potential between the heat and the energy sink. This is why they invented condensers for steam engines, improve the efficiency immediately. And uh, this is why I mentioned uh, what his father's line of work was. Uh, in the beginning of this book, it's clear he's casting a jealous eye across the channel to England. To take away England's steam power would be, in short, to annihilate that colossal power. Um, I don't know how much envy there was there, but he certainly wanted his fellow countrymen to be smart about steam. So that's kind of a prologue. The, uh, I, I don't think I need to do the second law of thermodynamics, do I? Um, and th that's a bad teacherly question. Raise your hand if you're ignorant and need to be corrected. <laughs> oh. So we're all grown ups here, good, good. Okay, second law of thermodynamics. Well, okay, let's do both of them. The first law, uh, Matter and energy can neither be created nor destroyed, only transformed. Ta-da. Um, the second law, that's true about energy, but here's this other interesting fact about energy. You can't recycle it. That's one of the shortest ways to say the second law. You can't recycle energy. There are uh, 26 more complicated ways to say it. Uh, at some point, Rudolf Clausius, I think it was 1856, invented the term entropy to describe the amount of energy within a closed thermodynamic system that was unavailable to do work. So you have energy useful becoming entropy unuseful. And the coining of this kind of negative term, like it's a, it's a name for a thing that's a negative quality, uh, allowed him to state the second law very succinctly, which is within any closed thermodynamic system, entropy must increase. You can't run it uphill. So uh, that thing that Carnot said about this is actually a statement sort of of the law of entropy, but he wasn't using the term. And uh, it was kind of general, but it was about heat. And it wasn't until later that uh, we came to understand that it applies to all forms of energy. So um, that was kind of prologue. Here we go, chapter one, Berlin, Dateline, 1890. Spring day. Um, I don't know what day, because he didn't put it in his memoirs, but on a spring day in 1890, this guy made the journey to Berlin. And you know I should be able to tell you where he lived. That's one of those details, but I don't know. But it was a trip. It was a trip for him, and it was arranged by one of his colleagues who wanted him to meet with physicists in Berlin because he, Ostwald, had been discovering absolutely how useful the first and second laws of thermodynamics were in thinking about chemistry. And if you think about it, you can see they would be enormously useful. You're trying to come up with a chemical modeling understanding of what goes on when you pour things together and they bubble and steam and change. In any transformation like that, the account has to balance. You're not making stuff disappear. You're not, you're not bringing stuff into being. And in any spontaneous process, um, there has to be greater entropy at the end. So he was finding these. Uh, laws enormously useful in thinking about chemistry. And he journeyed 
to Berlin to share his enthusiasm with some physicists that uh, a colleague of his knew. And he made a presentation to them, and I think they argued late into the night. Uh, he told them that physics, too, needed to undergo a radical reorienta reorientation in light of the laws of thermodynamics. He said, from now on, the whole of physics had to be represented as a theory of energies. Thermodynamics isn't a subcategory, a subdiscipline. It's the foundation for all of physics. Guess what the physicists said? <laughs> I don't think any one of them said, oh my god, you've opened my eyes. Uh, in fact, in uh, Oswald's memoir, he says uh, he was met with ridicule and abuse. And they found the idea so absurd that they refused to take it seriously at all. By his own account, and I don't know how self-romanticizing he was, but by his own account, he spent a troubled night in his hotel room and arose before dawn to walk the lonely streets of Berlin. Uh, OK, technically, those bicycles, they're kind of 20th century. Sorry. You can't find a pic like Berlin, 1890, nighttime. Um, Dawn found him in the Tier Garden, the uh, zoo, zoo Garden a Park in uh, Berlin. And uh, as the sun came up, it's a spring morning. There's budding life all around him. And uh, he had an epiphany. He, descri he describes this as a personal Pentecost. He had a moment of revelation. Uh, you could just picture it, birds tweeting feeding their young, little squirrels scampering. It's like, this is energy. This is energy coursing through matter. Uh, he'd been puzzled a little bit about the dualism of matter and energy, and suddenly it collapsed for him right there. It's all energy. It's all energy. He took that epiphany uh, and began developing uh, a program. He thought this insight would unify the physical sciences. And he also thought that uh, it had enormous consequences for all of human learning, like history, like metaphysics, that, that monism rather than that dualism, even morals. <laughs> Laws of thermodynamics, morality. Um, well, ever hear of the categorical imperative? Immanuel Kant, it's like, a, it's like a meta version of the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have do un, them do unto you. Except, wait a second, that doesn't really apply in all cases. Because um, I want, uh, when I'm old, I want my daughter to take care of me. But I don't want to take care of her when I'm old. So um, let's, um, I mean, you know, you know what I mean? Um, context counts for something in moral principles. And the golden rule is just a straight up tit for tat do what you would have done to you. That might not be the right thing for that person. So Kant uh, put it at a meta level and said, act only in accordance to that maxim whereby you can, at the same time, will that it should become a universal law. Whatever principle you act on, you should be confident that you could wish that everyone followed that principle. Notice the Germanic syntax. Um, well, the, the insight that that Oswald had kind of cut through that for him. And he came up with a new categorical imperative. Pretty clear, just waste no energy. If the energy of the planet is finite, and if it degrades, and if it's crucial to life, then anyone who wastes energy is doing a disservice to life on the planet. It's not clear how much he connected this with economic activity. But uh, it is clear that it led him in a direction that implies that uh, it did. Before we go there, I forgot I stuck these slides in. You see this categorical imperative in something that uh, Lord Kelvin said about Niagara Falls. There it is, pretty, isn't it, in the colored postcard. He said, beautiful as that wonderful work of nature is, it would be more beautiful still if those waters fell upon turbine wheels, every one of which was turning the wheels of industry. That waterfall is just going to waste. Waste no energy. That's not beautiful. What's beautiful is factories. Um, he, uh, Kelvin went on to uh, participate in the electrification of Niagara and the building of the dynamo there. 
And there he is, uh, hunched over some machinery. Oswald took his insight and uh, developed it into what he called energism. And it had some, it had quite a few features, and I've just highlighted a few. One is an international language. Sure, translation is a needless waste of energy. No, there's no appreciation here for diversity of cultures. It's just like, no, what a waste of time, or a culture has to, your society has to support people whose job it is to tell you what other people said. That's a waste. Um, and I think he had a hand in or certainly helped inspire the movement for um, that, that made up language, right? Esperanto. This part isn't so pretty. Um, he thought the categorical imperative, waste no energy, led you right to eugenics. This is actually from a display in Kansas at a state fair. Um, eugenics doesn't have the bad name didn't have the bad name then that uh, later events gave to it. Um, and if you go searching on the internet, you can find pictures of the, uh, the eugenics pavilion at the Kansas State Fair where they are. Uh... Um, yeah, so uh, before it got a bad name, eugenics was sold as, uh, hey, we're conscious upright beings. Let's take control of our own evolution. Let's be responsible here. Let's do it right and let's save energy because incorporating energy into uh, inferior specimens is frankly a waste. It also led him to advocate for technocracy. Um, hard to find, <laughs> how do you find a picture that illustrates technocracy? The idea behind technocracy was, uh, and those of you familiar with utilitarian philosophy and actually uh, Pincho, yeah, straight, straight Benthamite, uh, let's, let's manage things for the greatest good for the greatest number over the greatest amount of time. You know, Oswald was talking about calories. And the way to do that was with an international federated group of elites, maybe chosen eugenically, uh, who were competent to run things. Uh, and so his thinking inspired a technocracy party. I once wrote in something, the short-lived technocracy technocracy movement in the United States and parts of Europe, and someone wrote back to me and said, we are not short-lived. <laughs> <laughs> okay, they have a newsletter, you can sign up for it. Uh, chapter two. So the laws of thermodynamics exercised what you can call a reconstructive impulse, or you could just say radically a revolutionary effect on many fields. Oswald was right. These were radical ideas. They would shake the foundations of Newtonian science. Newtonian science is a science of mechanism. It's, it's based on mechanical, mechanical laws, and they seem to work for many things. But there's some things they don't work for. If you imagine a movie of a gearbox being shown to you, and the gears are spinning, you can't tell whether the movie's being run forward or backwards. It's a purely mechanical process. If you pan the camera back and include the engine that drives the gearbox, then you know, because there's no engine in the world that has ever been invented or ever can be invented that'll take heat and motion and crank out fuel. That's a violation of the second law. So uh, physics at that time was based on sound Newtonian principles, but it was running into some anomalies, some problems. And those issues were uh, miraculously, many of those issues were miracul miraculously solved in uh, what physics still calls the miracle year, when this guy, um, a Swiss patent clerk, published four papers in the same year in a peer-reviewed journal um, on physics. He tackled the problems of Brownian motion, photoelectric effects, special relativity, relativity and mass energy equivalence. And uh, he came up with what is probably the uh, best known formula in the history of physics, uh, which says all is energy, as I read it. So physics felt the, the reconstructive impulse of thermodynamic ideas. So did biology. Um, here. You know, I read this stuff, and I can report it. I'm out of my depth. There are ecologists in the room who probably could tell you more about it. But a quick tour, uh, Edgar Transo, 1926, calculated the energy capture of an Illinois cornfield. 
Charles Elton gave us the concepts of food chains and food webs, began understanding relationships in nature as energy transmission relationships. And A.G. Tansley coined the term ecosystem and began studying them as matter and energy complexes subject to physiochemical law, including the laws of energy. So biology went through a thermodynamic, th its thermodynamic revolution in the 1920s. Another field that felt uh, the impulse of thermo. oh, here's a couple of pictures that, right. So we have these concepts in this language now, thanks to thermodynamics. Another field that felt the reconstructive impulse of thermodynamics was history. And uh, here I'm featuring the work of two brothers who uh, were writing in the closing decade of the 19th century. And I'm showing you Brooks first, because he wrote The Law of Civilization and Decay, which uh, I've just decided recently, you know, I want to go back to. I've been participating in a money seminar here at the Gund, and I dimly recall, I read this book 20 years ago, and I dimly recall he talks about energy and money. It's a history of civilization looking at energy use and debt. That sounds very contemporary. Um, I, I need to reread this book. Here is uh, one thing, like fundamental principle that he grounded this history of civilization on. Uh, just kind of following the logic. Wait, animal life incorporates energy. Humans are animals. Therefore, human life must uh, manifest energy. Societies differ in the amount of energy they have. Uh, he, he wrote this history. It's kind of turgid. And um, it became very controversial because he published it right in the middle of the um, the uh, free silver fuss in this country when there was deflation because the money supply wasn't matching the need for money and there was uh, William Jennings Bryan and the populist movement arguing for coinage and silver. You ever see The Wizard of Oz? Yeah, it's all about that. Did you know that? Yeah, yeah. yeah. The Land of Oz, OZ, get it? Um, and in the book, the ruby slippers were actually silver. Yeah, so it, uh, the Wizard of Oz is an allegory of the free silver movement. Uh, and Brooks wrote his book about um, the fate of civilizations running out of energy when they ran out of, uh, when the money supply was contracting. And his brother Henry said to him, after Henry read the manuscript, he said, I know not if you have any political ambitions, but publishing this book will be the death of them. <laughs> The gold bugs will be all over you. And the gold bugs were the people who had money, the banking interests who wanted to see the money supply kept small because when the money supply is small, money is more valuable. Um, Adams read uh, a manuscript copy of his brother's book in the crisis summer of 1893 when there was a financial panic, the worst that the country had seen until then. And we tend to forget about it because there was the Great Depression just a few decades later. Um, but uh, many people in, in this class and, and others uh, really felt like the economy was on a precipice, that things were falling apart and they didn't know what was going to happen. Brooks wrote very movingly about uh, his sessions that summer. They both came home to attend to the family finances. They're, you know, uh, um, these guys are uh, grandsons of one president and great grandsons of another. Those Adamses, and you know they aren't—they weren't wealthy on the on a scale of like Morgan and 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 Rockefellers and stuff. But they had property interests in farms, and uh, they some of those interests were threatened. And so the family gathered that summer. And Brooks said, "I wasn't going to miss the opportunity to share my book with Henry." Um, and I had him read it, and we sat up late into the night, many an evening, with an excitement verging on revolution. Because they thought, here, we found the ideas that explain what's happening right now and the fate of uh, the Western world. Henry went on to write um, a couple of things that show a clear influence of Brooks's book, and also Wilhelm Oswald, who he talks about at some length in Letter to Teachers of American History. And um, Henry, is, he's like a really interesting thinker and hard to wrap your brain around because he doesn't fit into many of our modern categories. 
but I thought I would put this as a sort of representative passage up to show that um, he, he was on to something back then in 1918. Yeah, and he had immersed himself in figures on coal transported, and Brooks's book is filled with figures on coal consumed and the treasures uh, looted and stored and hoarded that increased the money supply of the countries that captured them. And uh, let's see, no, I didn't include... Sometimes I include a picture of a Spanish galleon because the this whole Spanish treasure fleet, uh, that whole deal was like, let's pump some money into the European economy. Um, it really, um, Spain's empire depended upon a steady flow of gold, which is why Sir Francis Drake interrupted it as much as he could. Um, I, so I want to pick up the thread of, um, it seemed like this, that idea that the Adams brothers had, that there's some connection between energy, civilization, the ability to capture energy uh, and, and some relationship to money, that idea lay dormant for quite a while until it began to be picked up by environmental history, which has enjoyed uh, a, a, it has flourished in the past couple of decades. And the modern roots of environmental history, this is a great book. I don't know how many of you know. Fantastic book, 1952, this guy wrote this book. He's telling the history of civilization as a relationship to its soil community. And he talks about soil mining, practices that extract the fertility of the soil faster than it can be built. And he shows how um, certain civilizations aren't with us anymore because they engaged in soil mining. Uh, when I first read this book, it like mm, there was some kind of, you know, scales fell from my eyes. If you were like me in uh, mm, high school history, you're turning the pages, it's chapter this, chapter that, and oh, here's the Oklahoma land rush. Oh, look at that, wagons all lined up, gunshot, boom, off they go. That's why they're called Sooners, because some people stuck in, snuck in there sooner than others. But it was a big Anglo-American rush for prairie land. And then you flip some pages and there's the, the free silver moon, and some other stuff, some other stuff, and then boom, there's, a, oh, the Dust Bowl. Well, let's flip back to that land rush. Um, the prairie, a climax ecosystem, went completely under the plow in the space of just eight or nine years, which was an enormous shock, no doubt. Um, you don't get that in the standard kings, presidents, battles, political event history. They're separated by chapters. Uh, this is the first book I ran across that started putting that stuff together. It doesn't talk specifically about energy, but soil is a kind of carbon, carbon energy is stored in soil. Um, Lewis Mumford starts to get close to the idea of energy as, a, as, an, ex, as an explanatory factor in history. And then I, uh, just for fun, I tiled up a whole bunch just to show you, yeah, there's been an explosion of scholarship in environmental history. Here are a couple of classics. Um, this is a great book. Uh, this guy doesn't talk about energy so much, but it's an environmental history, and now we have area studies, environmental histories, and, and country studies, environmental histories, and uh, ecosystem item environmental histories, and of course there's a profusion of books about climate change. I want to, uh, and here is sort of, you know, not to say this is the capstone, um, but yeah, you get books like this, A History of Humanity's Unappeasable Appetite for Energy. And you're starting to see books like this, um, which I'm in the middle of, so I can't fully describe, but uh, I know how it starts. And in the beginning, he includes an Eroy analysis of the Roman civilization. It's very readable. He's a, um, I wouldn't say chatty, but there's a first person narrator, and he says, basically, I was walking through the Colosseum, and I saw a keystone, and I thought, it must have taken a lot of work to get that up there. How did they do that? And then he started thinking, well, they had some levers, and how, but how much actual energy lifting that stone against gravity? And he started doing the math, and he did it uh, for that stone and all the other stones, because why not? <laughs> and he figured out, okay, they had human muscle power, they had animal power. How much land area would you need to grow enough grain to feed the animals and the workers who built the Colosseum? And you have to feed them all the time. You can't turn them on and off. You've got to feed them all year, even if they're not working all year. 
And uh, he came up, you know, I, I don't have a head for numbers, but he comes up with this figure. And then he compares it to the uh, breadth and depth of the empire and shows how, you know, the empire expanded as an energy capture machine. And as it extended into new areas and got new agricultural fields that it could take the produce, produce from and extract through taxation and ship it back, it also had to increase its degree of complexity to keep this vast expanse under control. You need centurions, and you need uh, messengers, and you need clerks. Clerks who, by the way, are like... military. Yeah, the centurions, yeah. And, and uh, clerks who aren't even using typewriters the way uh, we did in World War II, let alone word processors. But uh, he, um, uh, Homer Dixon says, it became a very complex system that reached the end of its ability to live on the energy return it was getting from increasingly degraded, uh, increasingly lower energy return on energy invested as it expanded. It took more energy to do all that stuff and get, get the energy back to Rome. Yeah, so um, it's interesting to see that there are now histories being written that, that are showing this integration of a fundamental ecological, economic, political truth that it takes energy to organize and maintain complex systems. And uh, diminish the energy, diminish it suddenly, and the system simplifies suddenly, which is also a uh, synonym for crash or collapse. So alone among the disciplines that I'm reviewing here, pretty much alone among uh, your major fields of study, economics has remained immune to the reconstructive impulse of thermodynamics. Not like we didn't give it a chance. Um, Frederick Soddy, familiar? Yeah, yeah. He gave, this, uh, he gave us this tripart division between wealth, virtual wealth, and debt. The key thing about wealth is it's got an origin in matter and energy extracted from the planet. Uh, virtual wealth, money that, repre that represents a claim on wealth, is an abstraction. In his era, the gold standard, it too was something you extracted from the planet. So he could say virtual wealth represents uh, the opportunity cost of the stuff you could have made if you weren't busy mining gold and silver. Now that uh, money is pixels, the opportunity cost is pretty low. Um, and debt is a claim on the future production of real wealth. And then the deal is we have a system that lets debt grow uh, unchecked infinitely, exponentially, while the wealth that it is a claim on can only grow gradually because it's physical. And um, it occurred to me, and I'm sorry, this productivity of wealth, I just meant wealth. I didn't get that word erased out of there. But so, you know, the basic idea. Wealth increases, can increase, uh, debt can increase exponentially. Wealth only grows gradually. Um, that curve might look familiar because remember Malthus, who said the same thing about food and population? Well, the similarity isn't accidental. Uh, agricultural productivity has a root in nature, it is low entropy. And population uh, breeds the way uh, interest breeds. So you can kind of line these things up and say, look at this. Saudi offered us a kind of version of a monetary Malthusianism. But they should be, like, Saudi is over there and Malthus is over here. Um, I think, and I often tell audiences, you know, no one ever proved Malthus wrong. His arguments were just put on pause for a couple of centuries by the trick humans learned of turning antique solar income into food in the present. And the fundamental dynamic is coming roaring back right now. Um, the equivalent to that petrochemical subsidy to agriculture in uh, the Saudi system is well, okay, so they instigated the FDIC, which is supposed to stop um, the Federal Deposit Insurance uh, Corporation, which is an insurance corporation that keeps 
over-leveraged banks from deleveraging radically when contraction comes. It's like they treated a symptom and didn't get at the cause, which is the exponential increase in debt. A second try at uh, making economists see the thermodynamic light um, came about in the 70s. Gas lines outside and uh, inside in a bookstore, you could buy that book. Uh, not many economists did. Although, uh, Paul Samuelson, interestingly, there's a blurb on that book from Paul Samuelson that says, Nicholas Georgescu's ideas will interest scholars when today's skyscrapers have crumbled into dust. Uh, if you're with me on this, so the law of entropy is ultimately the reason we have economists. If entropy, you couldn't imagine a world without the law of entropy. I mean, it would not be a pretty place. There'd be no death. Um, you could eat your own shit. Um, but if you will imagine with me for a moment a world without entropy, uh, there would be no scarcity because every good thing ever made would still exist in pristine form. We'd have an infinite amount of energy to do every good thing in life. And because, energy, uh, because entropy is the fundamental physical law that describes why we experience time, we'd also have all the time in the world to do every good thing that we could do with an infinite amount of energy. So uh, wherever you think the scarcity choke point is, whether it's energy or time or attention or whatever, it, entropy lies behind it. The law of entropy is what makes economists even useful. And they haven't begun to return the favor. <laughs> and, and some of us are annoyed by that. Now, speaking of energy as a master resource, here's a choice irony. Anyone recognize this guy? Julian Simon. Julian Simon. Um, a name that I think will live in infamy. Um, the reason this is ironic is because he says, right in the ultimate resource, that energy is the master resource. Of course, uh, human ingenuity trumps it because human ingenuity is the ultimate resource, the title of his book. But he kind of uh, grudgingly had to admit energy is the master resource. I don't know. How could he say that and also say this crap? <laughs> These are direct quotations from his work. Uh, uh, this last one is a gem of a piece of reasoning. The number of wells is unknown, infinity is unknown, therefore the number of wells must be infinite. Um, really, it's like, how did this guy not get laughed at? Uh, it's really annoying to, uh, I, uh, it, the, this book has a, uh, a chapter on uh, the Simon Ehrlich bet, chapter's called The Bet That Ruined the World. Um, and so I really delved into, like, what, so what was that argument about? Like, why did he win, and what, what, uh, and what did they say, and why, who took this guy seriously? Um, he wasn't read out of the economics profession, and he seemed to uh, function as a beard. I mean, I, he was never really embraced by uh, a lot of mainstream economists, but they sure didn't call him on his shit. They didn't stop him from talking about, we can have infinite growth. And if you look at that moment, some stuff hung in the balance back in the 70s with the publication of Mankind at the Turning Point. And uh, by 1980, Ronald Reagan was in office and was taking the solar panels off the White House. And you, you want to ask, How, why, what happened? And part of what happened was this guy. This guy provided enough room for policymakers to say it's not going to be a problem. And so, um, and you know, I didn't even bother to, to put this actually as like energy use in the US or something, but it's any one of those many exponentially increasing graphs that you can, that you can draw that we saw the other day. So um, you ask, why do we have that? And, and part of the answer is uh, Julian Simon didn't take seriously the laws of thermodynamics and the idea that energy is a master resource. So uh, I want to leave you with uh, this guy, and I, I chose a particularly avuncular image of him. He's going to say something to you in a friendly, 
uncle-like way. Um, and the quotation, and I realize I have it written down, but I'm going to try to dredge it out of memory. He said, the second law of thermodynamics holds, I think, an unparalleled position among the laws of nature. I don't think it will ever be disproven. Uh, this, oh, I'm sorry, this is Arthur Eddington. He said, if it turns out that your pet theory of the universe goes against Mac Maxwell's equations, well, so much the worse for Maxwell's equations. And if it turns out that some experimentalist proves your pet theory wrong, well, you know, these, these lab guys, they do bungle things sometimes. But, he said, if your theory is found to be against the second law, I can give you no hope. There's nothing for it but to collapse in deepest humiliation. <laughs> if economists, if mainstream economists had collapsed in deepest humiliation in the 1930s when they first had the chance, or the 1970s when they had another chance, we'd be in a much better place than we are now. OK, that's it. Thank you. A couple of things. Well, about like six months ago or eight months ago, I don't know if you all remember, it was this, this European physics center that, that first yeah, we discovered this subatomic particle traveling faster than light. And then I started thinking, okay, that, that cannot be possible. We have this boundary and so. But then I say, okay, let's imagine that we have a subatomic particle travel faster than light. What would be the implications for an economic system that is able to send information to the past and to the future. At low, so it's kind of like, okay, that's going to really transform, transform a, 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 like the transaction cost will go to zero, and all of a sudden we will have the applications of all of like the theorems that we, we cannot apply, you know, because we have possible, a, 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 we have possible transaction costs and so on. So having that in mind, you know, and, and um, like going now to the absurd, to the complete absurd. Do you reckon, like, if we really apply th thermodynamics to the economic thinking, then how can we contest mainstream economics and say, well, guys, what you're trying to run is a system that doesn't require energy, doesn't require materials, but we live in this world, then how can we contest mainstream <laughs> economics and say, guys, what you're trying to find is the perpetual motion machine that is fiction, but how can we make them understand that they live in a fictional world? <laughs> that's, a, that's a great question. Um, Max, as, sorry, as the physicists who try to discover the subatomic particle traveling faster than light, try to, because they also lived in a fictional world, according to this college. Yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> I've always wondered how, if something travels faster than the speed of light, you would see it. <laughs> <laughs> it's coming close. Um, oh, what? That was, that, there, there were one. Um, um, how do you, yeah, uh, Max Planck said famously, um, you know, you can make arguments, you can sketch arguments. He's picking up on the keynote from yesterday. Uh, he said, basically, science proceeds through funerals. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the young generation coming up uh, is not indoctrinated into a paradigm. Put two paradigms in front of them, they will choose the one that makes sense, the one that offers the ripest research agenda, the one that coincides. It, it isn't even that it is more factually accurate or more factually developed. It's uh, got to be, it's got to hold greater promise for solving the problems that that person feels are crucial. And so I am actually confident that this model will win uh, if we can get it into enough classrooms and in front of enough people. But uh, who knows if it's going to win faster? So just a question about the history of science. I'm, I, I'm a bit surprised that Oswald has been received so harshly by the physicists. Because at the same time, you have guys like Maxwell, Bozeman, uh, Kelvin. They all were working using the second law of thermodynamics for all the, at that time. Actually, we have the least action principle, which is based on energy, playing forth, which is much older. So I don't understand what was the mindset of those guys. Yeah, I don't know who was in the room. Yeah. I don't know. But it seems, yeah, there, w there was a ferment in physics. You would think they would have been more receptive to it, but they weren't. Eric, thank you so much. Thank you.